Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we let the Word of Christ dwell in us. Yeah, exactly. Richly. Good job. Uh, we are in Lesson 4. This is Day 3 of our study through Esther in the Faithful and Fearless Bible Study that we began two, four, six and a half-ish weeks ago. We started with Ruth. We finished that amazing story through Ruth, and now we're just jumping into Esther, and I'm really glad that you're with me. Thank you for joining me in this study. If you haven't already done so, this is a good day to like and subscribe us on, on YouTube or Facebook or the Dwelling Richly podcast, wherever it is that you're listening to, and a share. Tell somebody else that you're enjoying this Bible study. And whenever you share, be sure to share with a uh, hashtag because that helps people find it easier. And you can use the hashtag Dwelling Richly and our church hashtag LMCC Women. All right. And then tag me. If you know me, if you connect with me personally, I love to see when you guys are posting and sharing. So tag me in your posts um, because it helps me see it. You get a lot of posts all day long. And if I don't get tagged, it, they just end up kind of a blur in all of the rest of the posts. You know how that goes. All right. Let's go ahead and get started today, as always, with a word of prayer. And then we'll jump into our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the beautiful time to be in your word for a chance to just sit back and um, kind of set aside our cares and our worries and the things that are in our, on our mind and heart that we bring into this study. Help us to do that and really focus on your word today. Uh, bless us in our time together right now in your word and that we could really bless you by being in your word as well. And uh, we ask this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, hallelujah, amen. All right, good job. All right, let's go ahead and this is bugging me. My tip of my computer just keeps on bouncing right there in the edge of the screen. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and I'm going to change screens so you guys can see that. Uh, we are on lesson four, day three. And as always in our study, we begin with prayer and then we write the word that we're memorizing. And the memorization focus for this lesson has been through all of Psalm 42, and this particular uh, lesson, we are going to be in, um, uh, just, my brain just skipped a beat there, uh, we're going to be in verses 7 through 8. Let's go ahead on over there to verses 7 through 8. Today, we'll go ahead and read through the entire um, psalm together, Psalm 42, 1 through 8. As a deer pants for streams of flowing water, so pants my soul for you, O God. Don't you love how I just flipped that around? Let's try that again. As a deer pants for flowing streams... So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you? cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me hope in god for i shall again praise him my salvation and my god my soul is cast down within me therefore i remember you from the land of jordan and of hermon from mount mazor deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls all your breakers and your waves have gone over me by day the lord commands his steadfast love and at night his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. Mm. At night, his song is with me. And he likens that unto a prayer. And then he says, to the God of my life. It's, it's just so beautiful. I love it. I wish I read Hebrew fluently. I'd love to be able to read that for you in Hebrew. Maybe one of you does read Hebrew well, and you can read that for me. Or maybe you can find it read by somebody else and and we can, you can share that link with me so we can hear it in Hebrew. Wouldn't that be beautiful? All right. So take a minute to be sure to write that in the top box that I provided for you. We are writing our way through the book of Esther. And yesterday, or whenever you were listening last, we wrote Esther 1, verses 1 through 9. And then today we're just going to add 10, 11, and 12, just three verses to it. So go ahead and let's hop over to Esther 1. I'm going to read for you today out of the Christian Standard Bible. 
and then you can write it out of whatever translation you're writing. I've been writing my um, Esther book out of um, the English Standard Version, but I thought I'd read it out of a different translation for us today. On the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine, Ahasuerus commanded Maimon, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, or Zethar, or Zethar, and Karkas, the seven eunuchs who personally served him, to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command and that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. Uh, so we've got the first big moment here. So check off your boxes. Good job. You wrote, memorized your verse. Hopefully you've written. Perhaps you've paused and then you wrote. And now you're bringing me back in. And um, let's go ahead over and let's complete our, our questions now for this portion of the study as we dwell in the word. So at this point, how many days of feasting have there been? This is review from the last day of the lesson. And there's been 187 days all together. Seven days of this with everybody in. And then 180 with like his leaders and the princes and all that. So 187 all together. What condition, <laughs> this might be some conjecture on your part, but I, I think the scripture is pretty clear on this. What condition was the king in? Now you can, like I said, have a little extra added in. But it says on the seventh day when the king was feeling good from the wine. So I'm going to suggest that he was probably drunk. Uh, he was feeling good from the wine, and I'm guessing that he was high, drunk, wasted, completely inebriated, DUI ticket on the way. And I guess he's going to get that DUI served <laughs> by his queen, demanding under the influence, right? So he says he's, he's had his fill, he's drunk, he's happy, he's merry from all this wine drinking. So Ahasuerus is not unique in the list of biblical characters whose hearts were merry after having some wine. I'm only giving you these two references, but uh, you, you can actually just do a Bible Gateway. Just go on BibleGateway.com and do a search on the word merry or wine or drunk and um, see what you come up with. But let's go ahead and take a look at Ruth. And uh, you, those of you who've been with us in the Ruth study will recognize this moment. And maybe even while you were reading, it kind of triggered this, this in your mind. So she went down to the threshing floor, as is talking about Ruth, and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. All right. So we have instances of others in the word who were drunk with wine and were merry with wine. Um, and maybe not drunk, drunk, like stumbling and in the, you know, incapable of driving and whatnot, but certainly uh, merry with wine, <laughs> lightened up their spirit and gotten them going there. So we have this moment. And then of course, describe the scene here in Esther 1, 10 through 12. Well, we've got the king. He's been drinking and partying and planning and collaborating probably also with his kings and his, uh, or his princes and the leaders who were with him. And he's drunk and merry with wine as well in Esther 1, 10 through 11. Let's take a look at over here at this culture and context box so you can get some idea. Vashti was Babylonian royalty. She was the daughter of Belshazzar, the last of the Babylonian kings. Her grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and drove the Jews into exile, which is why so many are in Persia during the reign of Ahasuerus. Tradition holds that Vashti was the only survivor when the Babylonian kingdom was destroyed by the Persians. She was taken in this destruction and um, captured essentially, and then now she's become the queen. Um, there's other traditions sur surrounding this, and this is uh, 
uh, loose loose history and some uh, rabbinic teaching on this, but it was also it's also postulated that Vashti herself was an anti-Semite and would basically torment um, any of the Jewish maidens that she had um, in her service um, to the to the extent that she would have them um, work for her on their Sabbath, on the Shabbat, um, which would break the Shabbat for them as Jews. And she knew that. And so there's a, there's a long tradition in rabbinic teaching that Vashti would not only make them break the, the Sabbath, but she would make them do it naked. Like she would un completely humiliate them and that she was an anti-Semite. So you can do your own research on that as well. I thought that was an interesting side note. And um, so we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of things, a lot to support that Vashti was some uh, paradigm of virtue. Uh, however, in this moment, what does she choose to do? Well, while she, uh, what has she been up to while he's been partying? She's been throwing her own party as well. She has her party for her people, her women. What detail about the palace does the narrator note in one chapter one, verse nine. And why do you think the author includes this detail? Let's go back over to that. Um, he says, Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women of King Ahasuerus's palace. So the author goes to links to say, this is King Ahasuerus's palace. This isn't just some other house of Vashti's. This was part of his palace, but her side um, portion to that. Um, I, I think that the the author would include a detail like that possibly to emphasize the rule of Ahasuerus and that Vashti maybe um, because of being a captive herself and was not real happy with Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus, Man, that name is hard to pronounce. Anyway, <laughs> I actually would prefer just calling him King Xerxes like the NIV does. It's a little easier to pronounce. Maybe I should just do that. Anyway, I think I think she she had an attitude. She tolerated him, and there was no real love there for Xerxes, right? So what does the king command his eunuchs to do, and how many were there? Let's take a look back over here in our passage today. He commands his seven eunuchs, who personally served him, to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. Not just have her come, have her royal crown brought as well. This is interesting. Um, what two commands does the king give Vashti? Come and bring your crown. Those are the two commands. What was his reason? Well, let's take a look back over here. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was beautiful. So it wasn't just he thought she was pretty. The author is including here in the note that by anyone's standards of beauty, this was a good looking woman, a very beautiful woman. He thought she was, and uh, so did everybody else apparently as well. So, what is Vashti's response? The big fat goose egg, no way, not doing it, no how. Why? Why do you think she responded this way? Why do you think she responded this way? I have some ideas of my own. What about you? So, you know, I always like to, to hear your opinions before I share mine. But uh, so I'm, I'm not going to share my opinion on this one. I'm going to have you write it down. You tell me what you think. Why do you think she responded this way? Some scholars suggest, based on the timeline over here in the culture and context box, some scholars suggest, based on the timeline of this feast, that Vashti may have been pregnant with her son and future king at the time of her refusal. Jewish tradition has suggested that the king was requesting she appear wearing her crown, and only her crown. <laughs> in other words, yeah, exactly. Walk in, potentially pregnant, and in her birthday suit. This is, this is just the height of his hubris and his willingness to just do whatever it took to make an impression on people. And he's drunk, right? So how does the king react when she says no? Why do you think he reacts this way? What does it say? The king became furious 
and his anger burned within him. The king became furious at this. This is, this isn't just I'm angry. It's like I'm angry and I, I can't, I'm just burning inside about it and fuming about it. This is public humiliation. That's why he reacts this way because everybody around him is going to know that his own queen defies his orders. So compare the emotion of the opening and the closing of today's passage. So the opening of today's passage, um, the king was feeling good with wine and the closing of his package, it came furious with anger. So from um, very merry to very anger, <laughs> angry, uh, a huge shift in the tone, right? Write Proverbs 22, 24, and I particularly like the NASB translation of the verse. Let me go ahead and hop over so you can see that. Um, do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man. This is good advice. You can look up lots of Proverbs, but go ahead and write that down, whatever translation you're using. I actually really like the way that the NASB, probably because that's the Bible I grew up with and I memorized it when I was a kid, um, summarizing uh, this with an angry man, do not go, period. Like that, God is very clear on this. And who is Ahasuerus? He is an angry, angry man, is he not? So let me go ahead and close our time together with just these final thoughts. Vashi refuses to go before the king, and this becomes the first of many pivotal moments in Esther. Some have held Vashti up as a model of the first feminist. She defies her husband, to protect her honor. She refuses to be paraded in the front of hundreds of gawking, drunken men. She will not be at the beck and call of her rash, angry husband. Jewish tradition says that she, as the remnant Babylonian royalty, used this moment to deliberately humiliate her usurping husband in front of the princes and people at that palace party. Whatever her motivation, Associating with a hot-tempered man, particularly one in power, will not end well. Vashti's decision forever changes her life story. She may not have been free to defy the king without severe consequence, but there is a bigger story here, God's story. All of history is ultimately the story of God working in time to bring all people to him. Vashti's moment in time and history is a part of that story. For her, for, in her decision, God opens the way for Esther to move from obscurity to the center of one of the greatest stories ever told. All right, so small little three verse passage here that says a lot to us, doesn't it? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Be sure to share and tell me what you're thinking about this study so far. We've had a lot of anticipation going into it and I'd love to hear what you think about it. Tell me how you feel and what you're enjoying, what you're learning so far, and any insights that you might have. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, until we meet again, uh, know that you are loved and prayed for. Bye-bye for now.